Um, well, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, welcome to the third in our autumn series of Discover Wildlife Evenings. Um, I'm Chris Breen, as many of you know, and this evening I have the great pleasure and privilege indeed of introducing my, uh, my good friend, Nick Garbutt. Um, many of you know Nick, and of course, many of you have traveled with Nick. And I know that um, he is certainly one of the world's great wildlife photographers, um, maybe greatest, don't know, who knows? Um, but not only is he that, he's also a tremendous naturalist, um, a very patient teacher of photography skills, an excellent leader and an all round good bloke. Um, and this evening, Nick is gonna be talking about the greatest migration on earth um, that takes place um, on the Serengeti Plains in East Africa. Um, Nick is going to tease you a little by making passing mention of the Festival of Wildlife that took place here some years ago, quite a few years ago now actually. Um, but keep your ears peeled because um, Nick is also going to mention a future Festival of Wildlife that we have planned for the Serengeti. Um, before we launch into Nick's talk and before um, Nick and I um, have a bit of a chat about what's been going on, um, I need to remind you, of course, that um, you are very welcome to ask questions and um, we will deal with those at the end. Um, please feel free to make use of the Q&A um, facility, which you will find at the top of your screens if you're using um, um, an iPhone or similar device, iPad and so on. And I think it's at the bottom of your screens if you're using um, computers and laptops. Um, and or also the chat facility, which you will also find nearby. Um, Nick, how are you doing? Evening, Chris. Good to see you. I'm doing well. And yourself? Um, <laughs> I'm not too bad, despite <laughs> one or two IT issues that I've been tackling with. Oh, good um, old IT, what would we do without all the IT issues we have? It's Keystone well, Cops. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, if it's not me, it's you. So no, um, I'm, I'm rather hoping it's going to be neither of us this evening. But anyway, right. we'll find out. Um, hey, you and I haven't had much of a chance to chat in the course of the past few months because I know we've been um, phenomenally busy what, with the world reopening. Um, okay. And this evening's news, of course, is rather good because they've removed... Um, as no doubt uh, many people will have seen, they've removed the uh, the final seven countries from the red list. So oh, um, as of Monday. Oh, that's fantastic! But, I haven't picked that. But up. that's rather exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's rather exciting. So that basically means um, Ecuador's back on the cards, and they can have guess Peru, Panama, and places like that. Okay, super. Um, so that that's rather good. Um, what have you been up to or by in the last few months? Well, I think since we last uh, saw one another, which of course is at the end of. August when we had Wild yeah. Bear down at um, Wildlife Worldwide HQ. Um, I've done a couple of trips with my good mate Alex Hyde to Pembrokeshire. Um, yes. Obviously, as you're well aware, we've um, switched our emphasis over the course of this year to doing UK based stuff. Of course, and yeah. We had, um, we had a couple of good sessions on the Pembroke coast, and we're convinced that we're going to repeat that. At some yeah. stage in Pembroke and possibly even another coastal place because it worked so well, it was good fun. And uh, I think it perhaps reawakened everybody to the realization there's a lot of really good stuff yeah. we can do so close to home and we don't always need to jump on a plane. Um, no, very true. So obviously that was that was good. And next week I've got a couple more workshops locally on Exmoor, but uh, very short ones, two nights each. Looking forward to those. And in between times I've been working solidly pretty much for the past 14 months on a new book which will be out next summer, um, Handbook of Mammals of Madagascar, um, which seems to occupy most of my waking hours as books tend to. Um, but uh, We're coming towards the crescendo at the moment. I'm sorting out, drawing maps. I've just finished drawing 240 maps and I'm now going through all the oh photos, trying to collate all the photos and so forth. So it's all it's all becoming interesting, but um, yes, all in the pipeline. And and am I right in thinking that that book is is free to all attendees on tonight's Zoom? Well, providing you're paying for it. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, ah, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> hey, Nick, look, um, I should uh, hand over to you. I'll mute myself, um, which I didn't do terribly successfully at the beginning of this, the first couple of minutes. I do apologise, everybody. That was me shuffling my papers on the desk. Um, I'll mute myself and disappear and uh, really look forward to hearing your presentation on Serengeti. Nick, we'll chat um, a little bit later. Super. Thanks, Chris. All the best. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in. Uh, it's been oh, the best part of six months since I've done one of these, but it's good to be back. And um, I'm glad that it was been so popular that uh, by demand, we started doing another series over the course of the winter. Um, so this evening, uh, I'm going to chat to you specifically about the great migration in the Serengeti ecosystem. Uh, in Tanzania, of course, uh, and bordering Maasai Mara in Kenya. Um, this is northern Tanzania. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with it. Uh, it's possibly the most um, popular safari circuit there is anywhere in Africa, and hence, therefore, perhaps anywhere in the world. The northern, uh, northern circuit in Tanzania offers such a plethora of experiences and such diversity of wildlife. The wheels are very well oiled under normal circumstances in the fact that you can go so many places. So often a regular two, two and a half week safari will take in places like Arusha National Park, Tarangiri, Lake Manyara, which is famous, of course, the Ngorongoro Crater, and various places in and around the Serengeti. And you can quite frankly do that at any time of the year. Um, but I'm specifically going to talk about the migration in the Serengeti ecosystem, so largely ignore the other locations. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons that I'll come back to and expand upon during the course of the talk. Um, I would always, on any trip that I do, include a visit to the Ngorongoro Crater which I do include within that Serengeti ecosystem, even though it is effectively a little enclave, a microcosm of East Africa, um, which is not cut off, but just forms its own little ecosystem. And if any of you have not yet been to the Ngorongoro Crater, I would strongly urge you to do so. It is one of the natural wildlife wonders of the world, without any doubt. Um, the first time you climb up, the, to the rim of the crater and then enjoy this particular view from one of the viewpoints. It is quite literally breathtaking. There is there are very few places I've been where you just suddenly get hit by a vista of this magnitude and then appreciate the scale of it. You're standing the best part of 600 meters above the crater of the crater floor and as you look down with binoculars or a better still a telescope, you start to pick out the wildlife and enormous bull elephants look like ants just pottering along. And it's amazing just to see the scale of it. Um, so it's just the most wonderful place. And although it's incredibly popular and visited a lot, it's so special. I think it's always worth a visit. And it's so dramatic. Um, several of the lodges or all of the lodges that you're able to stay at or camps indeed, although I would always recommend a lodge, are located on the rim of the crater and particularly during the wet periods um, of the year. The vistas can be so dramatic with these dark brooding skies, rain clouds gathering and so on and so forth. Um, obviously the Ngorongoro crater is within the Ngorongoro conservation area which unlike the national parks, actually has an awful lot of human habitation in it. So you will constantly see traditional Maasai villages, Maasai people going about their daily lives um, as you move through the Ungargo conservation area, and particularly around the rim of the crater, where there are always Maasai wandering around between their villages with their cattle and so on and so forth. And it's actually really heartening to see that interplay and relationship that human populations can live cheek by jowl with charismatic large megafauna animals that ordinarily you'd think have to be kept separate and that's not the case. 
certainly in the NCA, the Ngorongoro Conservation Area, you're very much aware that everything lives next to one another, most of the time in a degree of harmony. Obviously, there is conflict at times, particularly with predators and elephants, but most of the time that's mitigated. So the crater itself, a visit down to the crater floor is magical, um, particularly if you concentrate your efforts early in the day and at the end of the day. Um, you can spend a lot of time on your own. You don't need to be with crowds if you do it in the right way. And one of the things that makes the crater so special is there's just such a cross section of habitats in a relatively tight area. And although you're restricted to keeping on the roads for obvious reasons, because the place would just get so badly damaged otherwise, I still think you have a very meaningful wildlife experience and there's an awful lot that you can see. So this is one of the swamp areas, um, which has a lot of hippos and an awful lot of other wildlife comes to use the water, graze on the lush vegetation and so on and so forth. And you're constantly reminded that you're in this giant bowl. It's a, for an animal's perspective, it's a huge salad bowl. It's just full of fodder to eat with this great rim all around you and the clouds spewing over and spilling over first thing in the morning and so forth. It really is very, very special indeed. And I think from a photographic point of view, one of the things that appeals to me, um, perhaps more than anything else, is the chance to put whatever subject you've chosen in context and you have this wonderful backdrop of this wall of the crater rim behind you um, all the time. So if you're using a longer telephoto lens, you're able to get this foreshortening perspective and place whatever subject it is. Here we've got obviously large numbers of lesser flamingos in the soda lake at the bottom of the crater. Um, but equally, it can be other wildlife, zebra, um, wildebeest, etc. Um, all of which you can set against this wonderful backdrop. And obviously, um, the main subject of tonight's talk is migration. One of the things that I should point out with respect to the crater is there's an awful lot of wildlife that is resident down on the crater floor, particularly herds of wildebeest, zebra, and so on. But everything can come in and out as it chooses. So a lot of wildlife does move in and does move out, although some of it stays resident. So elephants move in and move out. The Great Plains animals move in and move out, although, as I say, some individuals will stay resident. The only major species you will not see down on the crater floor or in the crater at all are giraffes, which, for whatever reason, it's wrong habitat, but also most people suspect it's because the rims and the roots down to the crater floor are just too steep for them to navigate. So you never see giraffes on in the interior of the crater. You do outside, but not in the interior. Um, Back to that wonderful perspective. Here we've got a lovely bull elephant. Um, and again, the crater is a very special place for seeing elephants. Um, large numbers of very um, mature dominant bulls seem to spend um, most of their time down on the crater floor when they're not in must and looking for females. So you often come across large bachelor herds of big bull elephants down on the crater floor, many of which um, are still um, magnificently adorned with large tusks. So the crater is, I think, the best place I certainly know left that's left for seeing really large tuskers. Um, and as I say, they move in and out, but on any particular visit, you are almost certain to see big bull elephants at various times, many of whom will have large tusks. This particular individual, I think, is now died this shot was taken about six or seven years ago and i don't think he's alive anymore um but nonetheless there are plenty of others so you're able to whoops um get all sorts of lovely intimate pictures of close-ups of elephants because one of the other features is that they're very tolerant and you, know, you can get close to them in your vehicle and that is true of most of the wildlife down in the crater it's very very tolerant and you tend to be able to get closer to it than you do in other parts of the Serengeti ecosystem. So whether it be zebras, wildebeest, whatever it may be, buffalo, um, you will get much closer often inside the crater than you will elsewhere. So as I say, wildebeest are 
resident, but some migrate in and out. There are always large numbers of buffalo, particularly big bulls. Um, a lot of them seem to spend um, their days, particularly once they've um, passed breeding age and fettel, they'll spend their time as bachelors down on the crater floor. The crater is also probably the best place to see black rhinos, certainly in Tanzania. Um, there's a large population that are guarded 24 seven, um, armed guards um, constantly patrol and um, look after the rhinos. Um, but you have a very good chance of seeing them, often at a distance because they're very sly, um, the rhinos. They know exactly where all the roads and the tracks are. So no, to keep away from them because they don't like being disturbed by vehicles. But once in a while, you'll get one that's moving and you're able to position yourself and you'll get it wandering by. Um, and obviously these two shots lead to that. Um, it's an excellent place to see a lot of bird life too. Cory Bustards is a magnificent male displaying. On a much smaller scale, this is um, it's a rosy breasted long claw. Again, a bird that's found throughout many parts of East Africa, but for some reason seems to be particularly easy to see down in the crater. And of course, there are lots of predators, um, lions in particular, several prides of lion that are um, resident in the crater, occasionally move in and out, but some of them are largely resident and it's well documented that they've perhaps started to suffer some breathing depression because their traditional migration routes have been disturbed and cut off because of human activity, et cetera. But still there seems to be healthy populations of lions and you can always come across them. Um, the backdrops, again, one of the things that make the crater so special that you get plays of light and backdrops and moody storm clouds and so forth, which are so different to many other places. So here's a shot I tried tweaking to black and white as well to make it a little more arty. Crater is also an excellent place to see one or two rarer things. Um, I've often had some of my best views of caracal in the crater, and it's certainly something you'd never guarantee, but there's a reasonably good chance. Um, just take note of the color of the grass here. It's obviously very parched and golden, dry season. So this shot was taken in September, whereas the next shot was taken in late March, early April. Um, obviously not five caracals. This is a composite stitch image just to show a nice running sequence of a caracal that was actually chasing a bat fox at the time. Um, so I hope that's given you a nice flavor of the Ngorogoro crater, which I would always recommend that you spend or make time to visit during any trip to northern Tanzania. Um, and particularly if you're looking to do a trip that's very much built around the migration. It's somewhere that you can stop off on the way to the Serengeti or even on the way back if you choose. I'd probably recommend doing it on the route um, uh, just to give you a flavor and a really good taster and so on and so forth. But it's well worth doing. And I, on the trips that I do, I always spend two nights there and we have three visits down to the crater um, over um, two and a half days, um, which I think provides a good introduction and cross-section. So we're going to continue now along that. Um, this is a rather schematic map, but you can see where the Ngorongoro crater is there. And the road continues in a roughly northwesterly direction through the Ngorongoro conservation area, which is a huge uh, area given over to wildlife and local people, um, Maasai people who live in a traditional way. Um, but it's that wonderful juxtaposition of wildlife and um, traditional human um, habitation. En route from leaving the crater, as you gradually start to drop down, you the first place that you pass through is this wonderful area called the Malanda Depression, which during the wet season, um, end of March, early April, is often awash with colour because of um, blooms of flowers. Um, as you start to descend a little further from the Ngorongoro Highlands, you get your first views of the Serengeti stretching away in the distance behind you. And this particular area where there are lots of whistling thorn acacia is often a place that you'll start to see large numbers of giraffes. So let's assume we're down in, into the Serengeti and I'll just explain, but by that, I don't necessarily mean just the Serengeti National Park. 
I mean the southern plains of the Serengeti, which actually lie within the Ngorongoro conservation area as well, which has important implications that I'll come back to later. But the Serengeti ecosystem, which incorporates basically all you see on this map um, and the route that the migration of wildebeest, zebra and other plains game takes. I think one of the misconceptions perhaps that some people have is that the migration takes place only at certain times of the year, which is actually rather false. It's a continuous event. It's always happening in some sense. So throughout the course of the year, the herds are on the move to a lesser or greater extent, roughly following this clockwise pattern from the Serengeti north up towards and into the Masai Mara on the western side of the Serengeti and then coming down the eastern side through the Loliondo National Park and game controlled area. Um, it's not a national park, it's a game controlled area. Um, and then back down into the southern plains of the Serengeti. And that's an annual cycle. But of course, there are times of year when seeing the migration and what it has to offer and the best wildlife um, is better at certain times of the year. So I'm going to start in May. This is roughly where the migration would be in May, which is just after the main herds, the wildebeest, the zebra, have given birth to their calves and they need to start heading north because the rains in the south have largely stopped. So the migration is driven by the patterns of the rain, which obviously influences the quality of the grazing. So they're following the rains and therefore following the better quality grazing herds. So in May, they tend to move in a northerly direction and up towards the western side of the Serengeti into the Grumeti area. This isn't a particularly good time to see the migration because the herds can be quite spread out and diffuse. So you're not going to see often not going to see great masses of concentration. Um, that said, Chris alluded to the fact that we held a festival of wildlife in the Serengeti um, ooh, a good 10, 11 years ago now. And we actually did it in May um, and concentrated in the central Serengeti areas, but we had enough reach to get to areas where there were migrating animals. And it's never totally predictable because it's so dictated by patterns of rain. So any one year is never the same in terms of where animals are at any one time as with, compared to another year. So generally speaking, May is not the best time, nor is June, although most of the herds get concentrated in the Grumeti area. Some of you may well have seen wildlife documentaries where um, wildebeest come down to water pools to drink and get ambushed by colossal crocodiles. This tends to happen here in the Grumeti River, along the Grumeti River. Um, but it's not a time I would necessarily recommend to go to try and see the migration. Because I say the, the animals, the herds can be very diffuse and therefore you don't often see huge concentrations. It's a bit hit and miss. There are camps in this area. They're often very expensive, exclusive camps. So you'll pay a premium to be in them. So um, as a consequence of that, often it's quieter as well. So that's another consideration, but it's not necessarily a time I would recommend to go and see the migration. Once you get through to July and later August, the herds are moving up through areas outside the National Park and it's really not a good time at all. So back into August, particularly the second half of August, they're moving back into the northern part of the Serengeti National Park and things start to hot up in terms of um, viewing and visitation. Central Serengeti, as I alluded to where we held the festival, is an area you can visit at any time. There's always wildlife there. Even if the migration herds are not there, there's resident herds of wildebeest, zebra, like you see here. And there are always um, carnivores to see. So the Serenera area, which is right at the heart, the middle of the Serengeti, is a prime place where you will always see plenty of wildlife. It's also a busy place because there are several large lodges. And you have to stick to the roads, which can be um, a frustration, particularly if you're a photographer, because getting to the right position with the light and so forth is often a little more challenging. But nonetheless, there is a vast 
array of wildlife to see. And all of these shots were taken within the same area. I think this particular shot was actually taken on the Festival of Wildlife that Chris mentioned, which was back in 2009 or 10, I can't quite remember. Um, similarly, this shot of a leopard, it's a, the Serenaria, Serenaria area is excellent for leopards because there are lots of lines of trees growing along watercourses. And you can be almost certain on a daily basis, you'll find a leopard somewhere resting up one of those trees. Um, so it's a place that can be visited at any time, even if the migration is not in town. Um, but if we go back to August, when the herds are moving up through the northern Serengeti and just starting to cross the border into Kenya, into the Maasai Mara, and then we move into September and then later October, all of the herds are then concentrated right up in the northern part of the ecosystem. So they're in the northern parts of the Serengeti or across the border in Kenya's Maasai Mara. And they cross back and forth constantly following the rain because the rains will fall in Kenya, then they'll be back in Tanzania, then they'll fall in Kenya. So animals are moving backwards and forwards across the border, which also means they're moving backwards and forwards across the Maasai Mara River, Mara River. Um, which starts in Kenya, flows across the border, and then um, starts flowing through um, the northern parts of the Serengeti and the Kokotendo area in the northern parts of the Serengeti. So this is a time, late August, September, early October, when it's excellent to go and see the migration in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. Similarly, it's excellent to see the, Mar uh, the migration in the very northern parts of the Serengeti. And this is a time when you potentially can see colossal numbers of animals, particularly if they're gathering to cross the river. A lot of the viewing at this time of year is very much geared around seeing animals crossing the Mara River, whether you're in Kenya or in Tanzania. And um, these shots were all taken um, on the Tanzanian side, so I was staying in the Kokotendi area. Um, and on a daily basis, we were concentrating on our efforts on finding herds that we thought were about to cross the river. And that can be in either direction, from south to north or north back to south. And just to give you a flavor of the sort of vastness of it, this was um, a herd, a fraction of a herd that was gathering one day, waiting to cross the river. And we thought we were going to see a crossing of utterly biblical proportions and we waited for hours hoping that it would happen. And in the end it actually didn't happen because the river was so swollen none of the wildebeest took the plunge quite rightly because had they they would have just simply been swept away and that would have been the end of it. So they were constantly judging whether the river was crossable or not and they judged that it wasn't. Um, so although massive numbers of animals gathered by the end of the day, they all dissipated again because they decided not to cross. But eventually you'll start to see, or you'll be in the right place at the right time when the crossings occur. And it is one of the most sensational experiences and events to witness in the natural world, I can imagine. Um, it's just chaos and the noise in conjunction with what you're seeing is just, it's on an immense scale. Um, and obviously this is a popular thing to go and see so it's very unusual that you'd be on your own that said um when i did this we stayed i think it was six nights in the area and for the first two three four days there were lots of other vehicles so we were always seeing crossings with plenty of other vehicles but the the end couple of days, we were able to pick and choose where we went much more uh, judiciously. And we had crossings that were largely to ourselves, um, which is obviously makes it even more special. But it's just an immense thing to see. Um, utterly, utterly spectacular. The scale of it and the numbers of animals, the noise, the clatter of the hooves, everything about it is just absolutely phenomenal and breathtaking. Um, and obviously from a photographic point of view, it just gives you so many options to catching great images. Um, but I would also add, it's not something for the faint heart and eye, but it's a of a squeamish disposition. Um, 
you're often going to see animals in distress because they get injured crossing the river. One or two of them will emerge having broken a leg or something. So you know that they're going to get taken by a predator at some stage. And of course, during the crossings, they're always potentially going to be attacked and predated by huge crocodiles. So um, it's one of the things that you may or may not wish to see, hope to see. I certainly wanted to see it. Um, but on most crossings, you, know, you do witness um, attempted attacks or unsuccessful attacks of wildebeest um, being taken by crocodiles. And so I say it's it's pretty graphic. It's not for the faint-hearted. And um, as a consequence, it may not necessarily be um, your cup of tea. Um, one of the other aspects that makes it perhaps more specialised relative to other times of the year to see the Serengeti is that you really do concentrate an awful lot of your efforts on seeing the crossings. Um, so you tend to spend the first two, two and a half, couple of hours of the day just after first light doing general safari stuff. There are a lot of really nice copies around the northern part of the Serengeti and you've got plenty of opportunity to see all sorts of um, other wildlife, marshall eagles, that's a nice pygmy um, falcon and of course things like Vero's eagle owls and so forth in, in amongst the coffees clip springers um, and of course where there are coffees there are bound to be leopards and so on and so forth um, but after that two hour period you really have to go down to rivers or the, the river and scope out places where you think herds are gathering and then wait to see if they cross. And that can involve waits of several hours before you might see a crossing event. So most of the day is taken up watching and then waiting for crossings to happen. So it's not necessarily a standard safari experience, but either side of that, away from the river, you have a chance of, say, in, in amongst off coffee, seeing leopards. And um, here's a nice female with a young cub in one of the coffees. And of course, there are lions too. Um, but this is an area that's within the Serengeti National Park proper. So again, you're restricted to the roads. The only exception to that is when you're viewing the river crossing and they do allow the vehicles to spread out so everyone is able to get a vantage point to look over the river um, when a crossing is taking place. But away from the river, you have to stay on the tracks. So of course, that does limit your options um, when it comes to how close you can get to wildlife and where you can position yourself photographically. So if we move on from October um, to November, then things start to dry out in the Northern Serengeti and the Maasai Mara and the herds start to move back south down the eastern side of the Serengeti ecosystem, largely through the Loliondo game controlled area. Um, and again, they start to be they're very spread out and diffuse. So it's not a great time to go and see the migration. There aren't many camps in that part of the ecosystem either. So it's not a time that I would recommend targeting to try and see the, the, um, the migration. Nor December as they've moved further south and are gradually sort of coming back towards the southern plains of the Serengeti. Not the best time. But once you start getting into January, then the herds start to um, accumulate in larger numbers down in the south and it's a time that you can seriously start thinking about going to the Serengeti with a chance of seeing the migration. So if you were to visit that eastern side of the Serengeti down through Loliondo in back into the Ngorongoro conservation area, you'd see this. This is Aldonio Lengai, the only active volcano in Tanzania and the wonderful great plains that it's surrounded by, often good for giraffe. A lot of Maasai villages in this area, so there are always gazelles and so forth. You won't really see predators because there's too many Maasai villages for predators to really flourish. But these are the areas that at some point the wildebeest will come through. So you can literally be there one day and it'd be plain and barren like that. The next day you might just see the smattering of wildebeest starting to come through. This is an area called Nasira Rock, which is just a little further south and east, uh, sorry, south and west of um, Lengai. And then the day after, 
if the rains are in the right place, you're starting to see more wildebeest and gradually the herds are building and building and building until you've got masses of animals again. So this is January and between January and the end of April, the herds are largely milling around these southern grass plains because these are the richest grazing there is in the Serengeti. They're extremely calcium rich. There's a hard crust of pan of calcium that's formed a handful of centimeters beneath the surface of the soil, which prevents tree roots penetrating largely, which is why it's covered in short grass and doesn't develop further to woodland over large or significant areas. So it's why the short grass plains are located down in the southern part of the Serengeti because of this concretion effect of the calcium underneath the soil. Um, but because it's so calcium rich, the grass is incredibly nutritious and therefore this is where the herds come to give birth to their calves because obviously they need calcium rich grazing for their milk, etc. So January through February, March and April, the herds are milling around all of these southern areas, moving backwards and forwards, slightly north, slightly south, around just following localized rain patterns to find the very best grazing. And an awful lot of this area is actually south of the border between the Serengeti National Park and the Ngorongoro Conservation Area. So an awful lot of this is in the Ngorongoro Conservation Area, and that's crucial because in the NCA, you don't um, have to stay on the tracks and roads. You can drive wherever you want off track. And that of course means you can follow animals, um, obviously at a respectful distance, but you can follow animals and you can position yourself appropriately to get the best images. So my photographic trips to the Southern Serengeti concentrate very much on these southern areas within the Ngorongoro conservation area because a it's the best place for the wildlife and b it gives you maximum flexibility to um, move around and work the light as you see fit and at this time of year particularly second half of february march into april it's when rain clouds are really building and localized rainfalls and patches all over the short grass plain, which of course is what the herds are following. But you just get these magnificent broody roiling skies, plumbious clouds that are just so wonderful to offset um, uh, backgrounds and subjects against. Magnificent vistas like this, short grass plains with a bull elephant. Now, bull elephant, like this is one that you could have easily seen in the crater at the start of your trip, which is 70 kilometers away, but they'll move that distance in two days. So this particular bull here is one that we were seeing down on the short grass plains. And I know because he was recognizable that about five or six days prior, we'd seen the same bull in the Ngorongoro crater. So the particular area that I'm talking about um, is if you look at this map and see where it says Ngorongoro Crater CA, Ngorongoro Crater Conservation Area, and where the N and the G of Ngorongoro are, just in that little notch in the um, NCA, specifically that's the area we're talking around about here and all the areas around, the area, this is the area I like to base myself, close to this magnificent lake, Lake Ndutu, very shallow um, alkaline lake. Um, and you can see the Ngorongoro Highlands in the background there, which are 70, 80 kilometers away. But this is, I think, the most spectacular, magnificent place in East Africa. It's my favorite place in East Africa. It's where I would always choose to go to watch wildlife and to photograph wildlife because it's a wonderful juxtaposition of plains intermingling with acacia woodland and depressions where there's water. And that crucially acts as a magnet for wildlife. So this is one of the richest places in the entire Serengeti ecosystem, if not the richest. And I think it's just mesmerizing. 
Lake Ndutu in itself is very special, often has small numbers of flamingos on it, not only lesser flamingos, but greater flamingos like these. During the period we're talking about, March, April, often an awful lot of white storks tend to gather. This was one particular year where there were colossal numbers of white storks, which come to Europe to breed, but are back in East Africa during the winter. And for whatever reason, there were colossal numbers had gathered in the area and were roosting um, for safety within the lake uh, at night. Sunrises in this area are utterly spectacular at times. And when you leave the lodge, which I'll come back to a little later, um, you tend to do so just before sunup, um, just as the very first, well, it's still dark, but you just know the sun is on the horizon. So you've been out 10 or 15 minutes before these rays start to just peek over the horizon. And it's really special. And of course, the dawn might be met by the call of a black-bellied bustard or something. And even very simple, special pleasures, just beautiful, heavy dews, allowing this wonderful mass of spiders' webs to be visible that utterly, otherwise you'd have just driven by without realizing they were there. And the areas around the lake are very, very good for seeing a lot of smaller, less glamorous species as well. Excellent to see lots of bat-eared foxes. The area is very, very good also for serval in and around the marshes um, that are adjacent to Lake Ndutu. And more broadly speaking, the area now is becoming increasingly good for seeing painted dogs. It's not something I would ever guarantee because of course dogs move around over such vast distances. But over recent years there have been dens on a reasonably regular basis within striking distance of Ndutu area. So it's always a possibility. Um, last time I was there we were lucky we found a new where there was a den so we're able to get wonderful views like this. Um, not something I could promise but um, it's something that's increasingly becoming popular. Now time of year is obviously crucial for seeing the migration, but it's also crucial for getting the best experience where you're not necessarily with lots of other people. If you were to go to the Southern Plains in February, you would see lots of people and you would potentially see scenes like this with lots of vehicles, which is obviously what nobody particularly wants to see or experience. The reason most people go in February is because when 95% of all the wildebeest give birth to their calves and people like to see them giving birth to their calves. But I would never go at this time. I choose to go on my photographic trips the second half of March through to the middle, even end of towards the end of April. Because the crowds tend to have dissipated by then. Um, so much more often, this is the sort of experience you could expect at that time where you have the entire plains larger to yourself. There's good reason for that. A lot of the accommodation in and around and due to during migration time is in seasonal tented camps. They all tend to pack up by mid-March because the heavy rains that regularly fall start to make it impractical for them to operate and it's too easy to get stuck. So they tend to pack up and go, which suddenly means an awful lot of accommodation options are no longer there so accommodation becomes much more limited and the number of people therefore in the area drops dramatically. And that's why I would always target going second half of March through to the middle, third, fourth week of April, depending on you know, timings, etc. And it's quite feasible then that you can spend entire days out on the plains like this and not see another soul. This was a particular day where, um, this is on one of my photographic trips, we have two vehicles each with a maximum of four clients in each vehicle, so there's plenty of space to move around and photograph. And our two vehicles spent the entire day, we were out for the best part of 13 hours, driving across the plains. We went 70, 80 kilometers away from the lodge, driving across these plains to see whatever we saw, and there was lots. And we didn't see another vehicle in that entire period. It was just magical. And of course, it's the herds that you're trying to see and target. And because the areas around Lake and due to have these depressions where rainwater and gullies form and water flows, 
herds are constantly on the lookout for large areas of water and streaming into areas where there's been heavy rain. So an area can be devoid of wildebeest one day. Overnight, you start to hear the grunts coming as you're in your lodge and whatever. You can tell straight away there are more wildebeest in the area because the number of flies increase. And then the next day you wake up and suddenly plays that were just grass the day before are absolutely cloaked in wildlife. And you can just be utterly surrounded by thousands and thousands and thousands of animals. And of course, photographically, that means you've got so many different options to play with and choose. You're not having to rush things because you know you're going to get plenty of opportunities. So one of the things I always try to do is get something a little different. Everyone now does motion blur pictures, but it's not still straightforward to get really good ones. So I often devote a lot of time, particularly on overcast days, to trying to get nice motion blur images. I also spend quite a bit of time doing some black and white stuff. I have a camera that's converted with an infrared sensor. And during the middle of the day when the light is harsh, it's often a really good time to use that to get images that are a bit more interesting in black and white. So these again are obviously nice slow panning motion blur images that are a little bit more interesting than just a straight record shot. With all of this wildlife, of course, on the hoof, there's a huge number of predators in the area, lots and lots of hyenas that you'll see on a daily basis. You'll see kills almost on a daily basis, um, hyenas taking wildebeest calves, um, scavenging calves that get lost or stillborn calves, whatever it may be. But this is sort of action is something that you'll see on an almost daily basis. Lots of vultures, of course, cleaning up afterwards. This is a lappet faced vulture that's actually taking nesting material back. Um, and if events conspire accordingly, there are times when the wildebeest congregate around Lake and do to itself and actually cross the lake, which as we can see is very shallow. But circumstances at certain times mean that huge numbers of animals come down to the lake and just stream across it, which obviously is utterly spectacular to get these large numbers of creatures just coming across the lake and you can just position yourself and watch them streaming towards you just in the tens of thousands. And of course, with so many prey animals in the area, this particular area around Ndutu is arguably the best place to see carnivores. There are at least four, possibly five resident prides of lions that you can see throughout the year. But at this time of year, the going is so good for them. There's so much play that they're very visible. They'll almost certainly at least one, if not two of the prides will have cubs of various ages. So you can be almost certain you'll see cubs, whether they'll be relatively old cubs. These are probably eight to nine months old. Or you might see a mother with cubs. This is, this, these cubs are probably four months old. These guys are even younger. These are probably two and a half months. And this little chap's probably only a couple of months old, very early, but two and a half months. And another set of cubs, um, probably four or five months. So you see a whole cross section of lions at different stages of maturation, particularly cubs around the different tribes that are resident of them due to. There's a mum with cubs that are probably six or seven months old. So the fact that so many lions are often visible means that there's always something of interest to tap into. And again, I stress, because you're able to drive through the bush and off the road, you get a chance to see things that otherwise you would never see, and you get a chance to position the vehicle in a way that means that you're going to get much more meaningful pictures. Lots of dominant males as well, of course, interacting, battling with one another. Um, this was a coalition of brothers that we followed on one particular morning that were dominant in the area at the time. This is going back about four years now. So they're no longer dominant um, in the area. But we had a magical morning just following these two brothers as they were patrolling their territories. And we were able to drive two or three hundred meters ahead of them anticipate where they were going to be and walk through the bush so you could position the vehicle, knowing where the light was going to be coming from as well. So you've just got the best chance of getting the more telling shot, something over and above a record shot. I know this looks like the vehicle is right up the lion's backside, but it's not, it's foreshortening. There's 
it's probably 30 or 40 meters behind the line. But this vehicle, I was obviously in the other vehicle, um, was parked up and the lion literally just walked up to it, round the side of it and came down the other side. So the vehicle wasn't moving at this point. And then we were able to watch and follow these lions before we left them be and they wandered off into the bush on their own. Um, so these are the sorts of experiences that Ndutu throws up on a regular basis. Lions, obviously, spectacular. Perhaps even more spectacular are the cheetahs of Ndutu area, because I think Ndutu is, well, it's the best place I know in Africa for seeing cheetahs. Um, on one extraordinarily special day where I went out with a group for the whole day, we saw 14 different cheetahs, including mums with cubs, in one single day. Um, that's exceptional, but you will certainly have a chance to go out and find cheetahs almost on a daily basis. And again, the beauty, because of being able to drive off road, is that you can follow them, obviously at a distance, because these are cats that hunt during the day primarily, uh, almost exclusively, in fact. So you've always got the chance of following cats, seeing what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether they've got cubs, whether they're hunting or not, getting good shots in your own right, um, or just waiting for opportunities to see behavior. So I've been lucky enough at Mbutu to see countless cheetah hunting attempts. I've yet to get what I would class as a fantastic picture of a cheetah flat out running or making a kill, but I've seen kills on numerous occasions and then some amazing experiences where we've seen cheetahs pull down gazelles or impala or whatever and watch them eat them and so on and so forth. Um, so this is something, again, if you if that's a priority on a trip, you can say, right, today we're just going to concentrate on looking for cheetahs and we'll spend all day with them and we'll get whatever we get. We'll work for cheetahs so we get whatever we get. Sometimes you get really lucky. This was one magical morning on a trip not too long ago, a couple of three years ago, where we found a female cheetah who had three um, reasonably old cubs. We found the very first thing in the morning and then had two magical hours in golden light. And we were the only vehicles there. Our two vehicles had these, this family entirely to ourselves for two and a half hours. And just watched them play and move around. And they were utterly unconcerned that we were there. But it was simply sublime wildlife watching and photography. This is actually not the same three cheetahs. This is a different um, family, but gives you nonetheless an impression. And just going back to the notion of using an infrared camera, um, during the middle of the day when the light is often very harsh and colour photography can be rather unre unrewarding, this is something that I would choose to um, do with an infrared camera because you just have a chance of getting more dramatic images um, because of the contrast that you're able to achieve. And even with leopards too, the Ndutu area is excellent for leopards. They're harder to find because there are a lot more trees in and around the, the bushland. So there's a lot more places for them to hide. But you'd be unlucky to go to Ndutu and not have one or two leopard sightings, as is often the case. You'll see them up trees um, resting during the day. Um, so the photography to a certain extent is limited, but every so often you get a chance you know, if you're able to sit and wait and then watch one come down right at the golden evening light as it comes down to start hunting. So I hope that's given you a really good flavor of what um, the Southern Serengeti and particularly the Ndutu area is like. Um, I mentioned that from mid-March onwards, most of the, if not all, of the seasonal tented camps that set up in the vicinity shut down because the road conditions when it's wet become impassable and it's just impractical to camp. However, the place that I would always choose to stay, um, right in the heart of the bush and bordering Lake Ndutu is Ndutu Safari Lodge, which is an independent lodge. I've been going there for over 25 years and it is my favorite place in East Africa by a long chalk. I think it is utterly, utterly magnificent because it's right in the heart of the bush and it's pretty small. There's only, I think, 30 rooms. They're very modest, very comfortable, um, all the basic necessities, um, but certainly no frills. You're not 
this isn't gold taps and chandeliers, super expensive safari. This is really nice, simple um, safari living, everything you want done to the very high standards, but in a very sympathetic way, not a fence in sight. So you can be sat on your little veranda, 10 yards away is this sign, and then 20 yards behind that is an elephant. So this particular picture, I was sitting in a chair outside my room when this bull walked right by 30 meters away. And as you can see, herds of wildebeest and you can just make out Lake and Bluetooth behind. So this was literally sitting outside my room. And this entire bushland area is wonderful for all sorts of other wildlife, smaller things that when you're out of the vehicle and you're not cocooned in a safari vehicle and you're able just to mooch around the immediate vicinities of the lodge, you've got a chance of seeing things like flat neck chameleons. And of course, it's fabulous bird watching too. Woodland kingfishers are regularly um, resident in the area. You always see little bee eaters. And particularly in March and April, when flowers start to bloom, lots of sunbirds move in. Here's a scarlet chested sunbird, malachite sunbird. And uh, this is beautiful sunbird, which is indeed beautiful. Um, and in the evening around the lodge, um, it's often a, just a wonderful convivial place to sit around the fire, have a drink, chat about the experiences of the day, do a bit of bird watching with these northern white crown shrikes that come in, a bit of fun photography with a bit of flash. So this is one that was coming in, actually taking pieces of popcorn off my hand, and I was not able to get this picture. And wildlife watching continues into the evening as well, because one of the things the lodge is famous for is its resident population of common genets that sleep in the rafters and the roofs and are fed each night um, on the rafters and come wandering around the lodge. And first thing in the morning, you'll often find them killed up on the sofas and so forth. So it's just a magical place. Um, which leads me on nicely to be able to say that the Festival of Wildlife in 2024 April 2024 will be at Ngutu Lodge. Um, I will be there, Chris will be there, and a host of other wildlife experts and fa familiar faces that work with wildlife worldwide on a regular basis will be there. Um, still in the planning stage, so I can't really tell you any more, but um, I think um, further information will be forthcoming in the not too distant future. So I'll leave you with that little teaser and hand over to Chris, who is going to um, chair the Q&A and poll session. Nick, thank you very, very much. Um, it's always a joy. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I really need to sort of go to uh, go to Tanzania now, I think. Um, <laughs> um, although although it's not quite the right time of year. But um, oh, no, it was wonderful. Nick, thanks so much. That was really good. Um, lots of questions as usual. Um, where on earth shall I begin? Um, I, I know where I'm going to begin. Um, just, so, um, just as a matter of interest, I know you mentioned you've been going to Ndutu for about 25 years. Yeah. Um, was is that sort of pretty much the first time you went to um, Tanzania? Was that to Ndutu? Um, I think I went to Ndutu on my second trip to Tanzania. The first one was a um what do you say a more um regular affair lots of places different places and the second time around we went to Ndutu and I'd never heard of it if I'm perfectly honest um <laughs> so I wasn't quite sure what we were going to we stayed three nights and at the end of that period of time I thought why on earth are we leaving why isn't the whole tour here and yeah I haven't changed my opinion on Dutu in the last quarter of a century. And um, so, so, so that's very interesting. And uh, but, do do you think? I mean, I'm often asked this question about Lwangwa. In in your view, has the Serengeti changed in the course of the last twenty five or thirty years? Oh, I think without a doubt, it's changed. Um, difficult to be precise. Um, I still think the experience is just as good. Mm. There are probably more wildebeest, more zebra. Um, there are probably fewer elephants. Um, yep. You still see elephants, but there are fewer of them. Um, 
and you still see the predators with the frequency. I think it's, in some senses, it's difficult to get an accurate impression because, of course, whether we go to the southern Serengeti and Dutu or Luangwa, we're visiting those honeypot areas where things are relatively good. It's what goes yeah. on the periphery where you know yeah. the problems occur. So I think in the areas where we tend to go to during our safaris, because by default, they're the best areas, so we go to them. Of course, yeah, and absolutely. You tend to get an impression that everything's rosy and perhaps everything isn't rosy. Yeah. However, I do genuinely think the Serengeti experience, it's one of the few places I could hand on heart say, I think the experience that someone going for the first time today would have would be comparable and as good as the experience someone going 25 years ago would have. Might yeah. be different, but yeah, that's very good, interesting. It would be as good in different ways. Yeah. That's very interesting. And is is there um is there a, is there a standout safari experience that you've that you've had there? With you know, if you could identify one oh. sort of most memorable. I'm not sure I could identify one. Um, there have been so many. Um, I have a a big soft spot for the cats, as you know. So yeah, any yeah me too. Big cat, but I think also the huge bull elephants in the Ngorongoro crater moved me yeah. so much because of their enormity, their age, yeah. their magnificence. And there have been a couple of times when we've literally had one wander by and you could have virtually touched it. Yeah. That as an experience, I just remember thinking was close to being as good as it could possibly get. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's a fantastic, that's fantastic, it, isn't it? You just feel so humble being next to something so utterly colossal um, that yeah. could obviously just turn you into cream cheese in an instant, but doesn't and just wanders by and pretends yeah. it's there. Gentle, gentle giant. Gentle giant. So that's certainly something I look forward to enormously when I visit the crater, that potential opportunity. And just the interaction, the fantastic interactions with cats around and beauty, because they're always there. Whether you go so, to the season or the dry season, there are always cats there. Oh, hello. Nick, I'm not sure if that's your connection or mine. Sorry, you just seem to have frozen there, Chris. Sorry. Nick. Oops. Yeah, no, no, that's all right. Um, um, Touche, you froze as well, but that, that might might be something to do with my internet connection, or possibly yours. I don't know. No, okay, no, that, that, that's now. very interesting. So, can you can hear me now? Can you? I can. Yes. Super. Okay. Um, so, um, at the at the at your sort of favoured time of year, um, mm. that period between January and April, um, with, with perhaps the notable. Uh, the notable exception of February. Um, is, is, it, is, it, is it super busy or...? or well, certainly I mean, Jan you, you... January and February is super busy, which is why I wouldn't go to the Southern Serengeti at that time. Yeah. Um, I would always personally choose to go in March and April, and therefore it's no coincidence that the photographic trips that... Of course. ...do there, that we yeah. do together, our time to be at the end of March and into early mid-April. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, but you will get a good experience at any other time, but obviously with certain caveats. If you go in the middle of the dry season, so June, July, August, to and do to, often you'll have it to yourself because there's no yeah. herd animals there. It's parched dry, but yeah. there's always game there. There's always lions. There are always cheetah. There are always impala. Um, and plenty of other things. You might have to work a little harder to find them, but you will always find stuff and you'll largely have it to yourself. Yeah. I mean, well, I was going to say... I, what, what... I was about to say, even if I do uh, one of my itineraries where we concentrate or spend a long period of time right up in the north to get the river crossings in the northern Serengeti, I still factor in four or five nights at Ndutu on the yeah. way up because the photography there is still so good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I, and I, and I think it, I think it is worth just it is worth just saying that that the I, th I mean regardless of when you go to the Serengeti, there is so much wildlife there. Quite. You'd be hard pushed to have a poor quality safari, I think. Exactly. exactly. I mean, 
it's just a question of prioritizing yeah. what you want to experience and therefore where you want to go and what you want to see. But you yeah. can go to the Serengeti or bits of the Serengeti at any time of the year and yeah. have a meaningful safari experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Nick, it might be worth just mentioning a bit about the weather in March, yeah. April time. Um, OK, so as my photos alluded to, it's when the storm clouds start to build. So yes. you're getting localised downpours on the plains, which is obviously encouraging the growth, which is what brings all the herds in. Yeah. So photographically, I think that's fantastic because you get all of that interest with the skies and the light and the thundery skies and the lovely shafts of light and all the rest of it. Um, it does mean at times certain parts of the plains you have to avoid because if there's just been a downpour, you can't drive across them because there's a lot of black cotton soil and you have to be careful. Um, but there's always places you can get to and always places you can go to. I and mean, the, the rains would have to be utterly biblical to prevent you getting to certain you know, to places. Yeah. So um, I like the fact that you're getting storm clouds and you might get caught yeah. in the odd rain shower. Um, you might get caught in your deluge, but either side of that, you will have fine weather and lots of greenery, lots of stuff going on, lots of action. So to me, it's just a much more interesting time of year, not only to see wildlife at its best and behaviour, but it just provides, I think, so much more photographic interest as well. It's very dramatic, isn't it, at that it's time of dramatic. year? It's very dramatic. You get the best of everything, I think. Yeah. Just yeah, absolutely. And, and temperature wise, super humid? No, okay. it's not, surprisingly, I, I think it's one thing that, that uh, if you're not familiar with the area, you tend to forget the Serengeti is high up. You know, yeah. You're a mile and a half up from sea level. So it doesn't get baking, baking hot and evenings can chill off. So you might always be sat around a fire. I mean, during yeah. the day, you're always out in shorts and a t-shirt. Of but course. In yeah. the morning, you might have to put a fleece on for the first hour or yeah. so. Um, so it's comfortable. Uh, it's certainly not hot and humid. Um, seriously, it's not like being in Borneo or Danum Valley or somewhere. No. Like that. So it's a much more pleasant temperature. But of course, it gets up into the 80s during the middle of the day, without a doubt. But, um, and it can get humid after a good downpour. But it yeah. does cool off as well. So it's not oppressive. It's never oppressive. Um, and then, so to finish that off, just going back to the Ngorongoro crater, when you're staying on the crater on the rim, where you're at eight and a half, nine thousand feet, in the evening it's bloody chilly. In the only yeah, yeah, yeah. one thousand yeah. increases without a doubt. Yeah. So, 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 does that mean um, you know are, are insects an issue it, at there at this time um, of year? Uh, not really. Um, other than all the flies that come in for the wildebeest, which are annoying, yeah. but not biting insects. And one of the nice things, because it's not bushland area, is there aren't any tsetse flies. Yeah, fantastic. Hooray. 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 <laughs> I don't like getting bitten by tsetse flies. They've eaten most of my flesh. Yes, but you will encounter lots of flies, but they're not the biting variety. They're just the annoying variety, because as soon as herds of wildebeest arrive, thousands of flies, millions of flies arrive. Yeah. What about mozzies? No mozzies? No, uh, a few, but not. Uh, somewhere like Ndutu Lodge has mozzie nets, so that's that's yeah. all that one in the evening. But they're they're not a major major irritant. No, and also they tend not to be so much of an irritant if it's cooler. And yeah. and as you say, once you get you know night time, it's cooler. So, um, so so maybe we should just sort of, um press on and talk a little bit about the photographic side of things because um. Um, one or two questions about that. Surprise, surprise. Um, Cliff, who is in New York um, and uh, hopefully apple. still on board in in the Big Apple, yes, um, uh, has has asked a, 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 an excellent question. I think one that one that many people would um, be able to identify with, which is um, um, if you were to take two camera bodies, for example, and two lenses that you were going to keep on your camera bodies in order not to have to worry about changing lenses and you know the concern of getting dust and so on in the camera bodies uh what what would you take um i'll have to answer that in two parts effectively um my standard setup is i have one camera with a 600 mil lens on one with a two yeah. for 400 
and a third camera with a 70 to 200 on. And they're just set up and next to me in the vehicle or in the bag. I keep them in dust cases. Yeah. I like a pillowcase. Um, obviously, I appreciate that most people going on safari wouldn't have that level of equipment. So to answer Cliff's question, I would say certainly something like an 80 to 400 or 100 to 400 if you're a Canon user um, would cover the vast majority of um, yeah. opportunities. And then something a little longer, a 500 or a zoom lens that goes up to 600, depending on what kit you've got. Um, having lenses up to five or 600 does help. But if you haven't and you're limited to 100 to 400, 80 to 400, fine. And then, of course, you could have a smaller zoom, say, going from, I don't know, 24 to 120 or whatever it may be that fills that gap. So you've got yeah. in two lenses, you've got everything from 24 up to 400 covered. And that will take care of just about all your photography needs. Um, and it's only if you perhaps want to go into it uh, a little more seriously that you'd think about going up to a 600 mil or so. Yeah. yeah, 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 of course. And uh, yeah, okay. But as Cliff rightly points out, it's a very good way of operating to avoid changing lenses because yeah. of the dust potential. So I do that all the time. I just set the cameras up and while I'm out and, uh, on safari, I do not change lenses at all. No. No, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Um, and, and, and also, although I'm, I'm aware, you know, of course, you showed a couple of lovely pieces of video in that. I know that your, you, you know, your primary focus is not video, yeah. um, but, but one or two people have asked about video and, and, and how the vehicles are set up um, and, and whether it's, it's possible to um, somehow or other attach the, the, the more fluid heads that you need for uh, for videography onto the vehicles? I'm sure it is, but I thought I'd um, pose a question. Yes, um, that would very much depend on the vehicles, um, obviously. I don't know if you can see this particular vehicle, which is one of the ones that we use on my trips. Um, and the lady actually in the picture there is a videographer. Yeah. Um, so she was using the beanbag. She did try setting it up. Um, on a head but found being anchored to one spot quite challenging so she was preferring yeah. to do it with a beanbag and found that was more flexible um certainly if you're doing things more seriously videographers tend to remove a door and put a fluid out but obviously that's beyond the scope of a regular yeah of situation. course yeah um but you can see these vehicles which are the ones we use with the people we do our safaris photo safaris with have been heavily modified with side platforms to accept beanbags um, that allow you to rest lenses or video kit on um, and stabilize it. We have tried to attach heads to it. It just depends on the type of head and the way it might attach as to whether it's workable or not. But we've always managed to find a workaround. Um, and what we've generally found is that during times when there's been someone that's keen on video there'll be periods where we'll just say can we be completely quiet for the next couple of minutes yeah. nobody move everyone who's doing skills just sit sit still they get a bit of video and then we go back but yeah we've, we've generally found that it's uh, it's workable yeah yeah um so there have been one or two other you know sort of more specific questions and, and lots of lovely comments about your your wonderful photography nick as as is normally the case um, nice thank you um there have been one or two more specific questions about the gear that and the equipment that you use might might be worth you just mentioning you know saying a bit about that okay so as i've just alluded to i i use generally have a 600 mil lens which is prime 600 f4 uh on full frame cameras um, a 200 to 400 zoom, which is f4 as well, and then a 70 to 200 2.8 on all on full frame cameras. And that would be my standard three camera setup for going out on any game drive. Um, and I just pick each one up as and when I need it. The, lar the larger two I would always use with a beanbag. The 
7200, which is obviously much lighter and more manageable, I'll use propped and handheld through the window. I generally sit in the front seat um, next to the driver, because obviously I often have to chat to the driver and make decisions about what we're going to do and where we're going to go, yeah. which means I tend to be much lower um, and I can't move around, but that's fine because you know, obviously I've done this so many times that I'm very, very selective now when I take pictures. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> bottom line is I'm not there to get my own pictures. I'm there to make sure everyone else gets their pictures. So um, there can, days can go by and I won't take an image, but other people will take hundreds. Um, so you, know, you just pick and choose your moments, but there isn't a day goes by where there isn't something good to photograph. But I, no. the other thing is I, I've had purpose made, thanks to my dear mum, dust covers um, for my cameras. So I slot, they're like fabric tubes that I slot lens with camera attached into to keep the majority of the dust off while we are from Safari. Brilliant. Yeah, that's a great idea. And you can buy those sorts of things, can't you? you? Can, and if you don't want to buy them, just do it in public. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, preferably someone else's rather than preferably your own. someone else's, yeah. Not the yeah. lot. Ideally, not the lot. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, Nick, that's absolutely fantastic. I should just say in respect to Festival of Wildlife, it will Festival of Wildlife in April 2024, it will be in the, that sort of middle period of April and um, we're looking at running a pre-tour to um, the Ngorongara Crater, doing doing exactly as, as you suggested of course Nick, um, and, and a post-tour um, into Uganda we think probably to see um, gorillas and chimps, um, but uh, obviously um, further information to be revealed in due course. Um, Hey, Nick, thank you so much. Could I trouble you just to put that next slide up? Uh, because then we can just very briefly promote you see um, Brett, who, who, who is doing his presentation on the 3rd of November, which I think is next Thursday, um, about uh, wildlife photography. And then the wonderful Helen Bryan, I should have said the wonderful Brett, of course, and then the wonderful Helen Bryan, wouldn't want him to feel left out. Um, the wonderful Helen Bryan doing um, a whale watching presentation the following week. Um, I think, Nick, we should leave it there, but thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant, as usual. And, um, and, thank you everyone uh, for tuning in. Yeah, and, and, and likewise, yes, thanks everybody for tuning in. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. All the best, cheerio.